Karl Dönitz, Hitler's ruthless naval commander. He was the mastermind. His U-boats claimed thousands of lives. There must have been few things more frightening than being hunted by one of these things. He was a fanatical Nazi who would do anything. What were conditions like for the slave laborers that were forced to build this bunker? To see Hitler's evil dream fulfilled. Why did Hitler choose Dönitz as his successor? Most people from my generation don't understand how over 70 years ago, a small group of Nazis could start a war that killed 60 million people. I want to find out, and to help me, I'm going to use playing cards. Today, they're used by both the military and law enforcement to help identify their targets. But nobody has ever put together a pack of cards for the most notorious group of killers in history. Working with experts, I want to know where each of these Nazis rank in the hierarchy of evil. My name is James Ellis. This is Hitler's Most Wanted. In many ways, I feel that Dönitz is the physical embodiment of the classic question, when and how someone who's in the armed forces becomes a war criminal. Guy, how do we decide when that line has actually been crossed? The answer is very straightforward. You break the rules of war. Of course, it often sounds silly that there should be you know, rules for warfare. But no, there are rules. The big question we have to ask about Dönitz is whether he actually broke these rules of war. Matt, I think this calls out for a question here, that if you're in the armed forces, killing is an integral part of your business. How does that affect your morality? To some extent, I think this is a larger question uh, beyond just the war criminals we're talking about. The question is, how does morality change in times of war? How does warfare alter one's morality? Anthony, why do so many people who are in the know about Dönitz's actions during the Second World War still try to present him as just a sailor following orders? The idea of the clean military has long been a powerful myth, and it's easy to understand why. People want to say that, sure, the regime was criminal, it launched wars of aggression, but the soldiers and the sailors who served were honorable. In the case of the German military in World War II, this is largely a myth, and it's a myth that Dönitz's reputation has benefited from. He also shaped his legacy and his reputation to benefit from that myth. Based on that, how do you value Dönitz's actions? I think you have to go to Germany and see the way his legacy is presented and contested. I'm on my way to Munich, to the Deutsches Museum, one of the world's biggest collections of historical technology. It's home to some unique artifacts that are the perfect starting point for my investigation. Carla, hi. Hi. So this is it? Yeah. Carola Dolka is the curator of computer sciences and cryptology here. There it is. Yeah, that's the Enigma, the naval Enigma. It's an Enigma machine the infamous Nazi encoding device for sending top secret messages. Wow. So I've never got this close to one of these things before. The Nazis used enigmas like this one to radio coded orders to their U-boats in the Atlantic and coordinate their attacks on Allied ships. So how did the Navy and the U-boats use this machine to communicate with each other? The, the one who uses the enigma always has to, to type yeah. the message to encrypt it or decrypt it. So when you type an X, maybe you get a T. But when you type the X again, it will not be a T again, but maybe an F or something else. During the Atlantic War, the German commander in charge of issuing those orders was Admiral Karl Dönitz. Dönitz was a German naval officer. He was the driving force behind building up the German U-boat fleet. Dönitz masterminded Nazi Germany's submarine warfare. It was he who realized quite how effective submarines would be in essentially blockading Britain and starving her of vital supplies from Canada and the United States. Dönitz survived the war and was arrested by the Allies, who put him on trial alongside 21 other prominent Nazis at Nuremberg. He was indicted on three counts, including multiple conspiracy charges, waging a war of aggression, and committing crimes against the internationally recognized laws of war. I give you one more opportunity of answering my question. Yeah, das weiß ich nicht. Dönitz was absolutely defiant at Nuremberg. He thought that he was simply a senior armed forces officer who had just been doing his job. He was just a sailor. 
he's not very well known among the general public. When people have heard of Dönitz, there's a tendency to think of him as an apolitical career military man rather than somebody involved in war crimes. But if he really was just an officer following orders as he claimed, then why was he tried as a war criminal alongside top Nazis like Hermann Göring? Who exactly was Hitler's star admiral? My search for an answer begins with this. It's a U-1 submarine, the German Navy's very first model, and the standard training vessel when a young Karl Dönitz joined the U-boat corps during the First World War. So this is obviously the engine room. These things are definitely not for, built for people my height. Just imagine how hot it would have been. So claustrophobic and loud too. You have to remember that U-boats and submarines were a relatively new form of warfare. You were hiding under the waves, popping up, you know, destroying things, and then slipping away into the deeps and the darkness. This is the torpedo room, the business end of the U-boat. During World War I, Dernitz became convinced that the submarine was essential to future naval battles. He wasn't as interested in surface ships as he was in submarines, and he began thinking about how to build up Germany's submarine fleet. Dönitz's U-boat was sunk by the Allies in the Mediterranean in 1918. He survived and saw the end of the war in a British POW camp. Dönitz spent a year there, fuming over Germany's defeat and drawing up new submarine tactics to beat the Allies if the chance ever came again. He's preparing for wars and battles that he wants to fight. He wants to get in amongst the thick of it again, and he wants to give the Allies a real hammering. Dönitz was dreaming of the day Germany's U-boat corps would return and redeem itself in battle. This is the Laba Naval Memorial, just outside the city of Kiel on Germany's north coast. Wow. I'm amazed at the size of this thing. It's impressive, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely huge. Yeah, it raises up to 85 meters above sea level. Dr. Jan Witt is a historian and a leading authority on Dönitz and German naval history. Now, my understanding is Dönitz's experience as a U-boat commander during the First World War made him a committed submariner. He saw the submarines yeah. as the future of naval warfare. He was a true believer in this, yes, yes, of course. The problem was that, uh, according to the Versailles Treaty, uh, Germany was uh, forbidden to have any U-boats. But in early 1933, Hitler became Chancellor. Like Dönitz, he too was a veteran of the First World War, bitter about the terms of Germany's surrender. He immediately set out to rebuild Germany's military. And in 1935, U-boats were reintroduced to the Navy. So yes. Dönitz now finds himself in the German Navy as part of Nazi Germany. Yes. Now, obviously he's in the armed forces. Yes. But to what extent is he actually a committed Nazi? Well, you have to understand the mindset of the German naval officers at that point of time. By far, most of them welcomed the Nazi regime, especially because this opened new hopes for re-strengthening the German armed forces. And right. Of course, new, also new career opportunities. So they hoped that the, yeah. the Nazi regime would make the German armed forces great again. Yes. Dönitz became a committed Nazi and a rabid admirer of Adolf Hitler. He also embraced Hitler's trademark anti-Semitism. He periodically made anti-Semitic speeches and made comments along the lines of, can you imagine what Germany would look like today without Hitler? There'd be Jews here, everything would be horrible. He said he'd rather die than, than live in a country that still had a Jewish presence. And he was one of the, the most loyal followers of Hitler until the very end. Dönitz was a rising star in the U-boat corps. He began training a new generation of submariners, demanding not only total devotion to duty, but to Hitler and Nazism as well. And um, so he could build up again a German U-boat force and uh, train his U-boat men according to his new uh, tactical ideas. And this is how he led 
or he led his, his U-boat warfare. In September 1939, Hitler once again plunged the world into war. Karl Dönitz's shot at revenge had finally arrived, and his U-boats were about to wreak havoc on the Allies. I can almost imagine what it would be like to sort of spot a convoy and then sending out a message to move in for the kill. I'm on a mission to determine where Nazi submarine commander Karl Dönitz ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. Right now, I'm on Germany's north coast with Dr. Jan Witt, investigating Dönitz's actions during the Second World War. Wow. So that's a real Type 7 U-boat. Exactly. The last surviving in the world. Amazing. Can we take a closer look? Yes, of course. Fabulous. Mind your head. Uh, well, I would definitely be too tall for a U-boat crewman. How many men traditionally served on this type of U-boat? Up to 50 men. 50 men? 50. So you had 50 men... Cramped inside this, this tube. That's unbelievable. Oh my god, I can't imagine 50 men fitting in here. Two toilets for 50 men. Two toilets. Two toilets. No showers. And uh, the aft toilet uh, was usually used as a provision store. So it was basically one toilet for 50 men. So, I mean, it must have smelled disgusting in here. Uh, yes. Wow. U boat crews endured these cramped conditions for months at a time as they prowled the North Atlantic. So, this is the radio room? Exactly, as you can hear yes. from, uh, from the wireless Morse code. So there you find all the different types of radio, but also the Enigma. Oh wow, so the Enigma machine would have been in here. Exactly. It's here that U-boats received Admiral Dönitz's orders of attack during the all-important Battle of the Atlantic. The shadow of the conquering German armies covered Western Europe. In June 1940, Hitler drove the Allies across the English Channel. Britain was now isolated, and Dönitz saw his chance to knock the nation out of the war. The Atlantic is absolutely essential for getting vital supplies from Canada and the United States across to Great Britain. These are absolutely essential lifelines for Britain to stay in the war. And one of the things that made U-boats so effective in the Second World War was the Wolfpack tactic. Now, that was something that Karl Dönitz came up with. Can you explain that to me? It stems from the, from the experience of, um, of the First World War. Dönitz started to think about different means of attack, new tactics, and so he came up with the idea not to have the U-boats attacking convoys individually, but in groups. August 8, 1940, the German war machine opened the Battle of Britain with an all-out assault on coastal shipping on the convoys that were keeping beleaguered England alive. So part of the U-boats simply keep the escorts busy while the other U-boats attack the actual convoy ships, mm -hmm. the merchant vessels, and, think, and sink them. This was very, very effective, uh, especially in the first stages of war when the British had not enough escorts available. By firing on unarmed merchant ships, Dönitz was engaging in a taboo tactic known as unrestricted submarine warfare. Dutch tanker, British tanker. Again and again, the torpedoes struck. Unrestricted submarine warfare is essentially a tactic by which you are going to torpedo any ship that basically comes within your periscope. It doesn't matter whether you target a, a, a neutral merchant ship. If that's sailing across the Atlantic to give some supplies to the United Kingdom, then that's a valid target. That's a crime. Winston Churchill famously observed that actually, if the Allies had lost the Battle of the Atlantic, they probably would have lost the Second World War. Dönitz seemed willing to do anything to achieve victory, even if it meant killing unarmed civilians by the thousands. Many believe that uh, the perfect soldier may be somebody who has, say, loose moral codes. Uh, certainly that type of individual might be very good at doing the dirty work, at uh, being able to undertake the types of 
actions that uh, would cause moral and ethical repercussions for, for other individuals. There must have been few things more frightening in the Second World War than being hunted by one of these things. I think so, yes. And imagine yourself standing on a merchant vessel in a dark night, in a stormy night, and uh, your vessel gets torpedoed. You go down and you have to go to a raft or um, into a lifeboat. And, um, well, I think the first thing is you're, you're done for. Uh, that's it, the end of your life. Dönitz's U-boats continued to wreak havoc on Allied supply convoys into early 1941. But their dominance was about to end. There are essentially three ways in which the tide turns against Dönitz and his U-boat campaign. First of all, the Allies managed to crack the Enigma code. So we're starting to uh, have a good idea of where these U-boat packs are because we're intercepting their signals. Secondly, there's another massive technological uh, advance uh, called ASDIC, in which you can uh, start um, actually pinpointing the U-boats under the water uh, with a form of radar and, and then just drop depth charges on them and just blow them up. And the third thing, of course, is the US then enters the war and with it, you know, greater naval power. That's another big threat to Dernitz. The longer the war went, the better the defences became and the more refined that the anti-U-boat tactics became and new weapons were introduced, the role of these U-boats more and more changed from, from being the hunters to being the hunted. Right. The results were devastating for Dönitz's U-boat corps. The casualty rates amongst U-boat crews is enormous, it's 75%. I mean, that is bigger than any other type of unit in the Second World War. But that didn't stop Dönitz demanding construction of more U-boats and sending crew after crew into what was becoming a slaughter. I, I can't think of a much more unpleasant death than being on the receiving end of an Allied depth charge attack when I'm in a U-boat. You must have felt entombed and helpless, knowing at any time that hull could crack and the North Atlantic could just pour into your U-boat and you're going to be drowned with all your mates. It must have been horrific. Karl Dönitz's ruthlessness on the high seas is well documented. But he committed a host of other atrocities that are far less known. Passiert. Und selbst nach der Kapitulation hat es noch solche Hinrichtungen gegeben. I'm on a mission to find out where Nazi submarine commander Karl Dönitz ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. So far I've seen how he embraced Nazism and unleashed his U-boat wolf packs in an attempt to starve Britain. Now I've come to Hamburg to investigate another side of Dönitz's cruelty. Where are you taking me? James, you feel... René Sinenko is a historian and an expert in Nazi recruiting during the Second World War. Das ist das sogenannte Deserteursdenkmal. Also der Gedenkort für die Deserteure der Wehrmacht und andere Opfer der NS-Militärjustiz. Das ist der offizielle Titel, James, yes? You must treat uh, from the opposite side. So we have to go inside to read the text here? Yes. Okay, let's go yes. inside then. As long as there has been war, there have been deserters. There have been people who literally desert their post, flee and refuse to continue to fight in the war that they're supposed to fight in. What makes desertion stand out in the case of Nazi Germany is the fact that desertion takes on a much clearer moral character when it's a matter of refusing to participate in a war of aggression, in a war of genocide. What would have happened if you were caught deserting from the German armed forces in the Second World War? Deserteure im Zweiten Weltkrieg wurden bei der Fahnenflucht, wenn sie verhaftet worden sind, vor ein Kriegsgericht gestellt und verurteilt. Wenn sie Glück hatten, sind sie mit einigen Monaten Haft, Militärhaft davongekommen, aber viele, viele Tausend von ihnen sind zum Tode verurteilt worden. Auch hier in Hamburg. Wir haben insgesamt 226 Namen von äh, Soldaten, die hier in Hamburg am Höldigbaum, Schießplatz Höldigbaum, hingerichtet worden sind. Aber wahrscheinlich waren es wesentlich mehr. How did Karl Dönitz view and treat deserters? Ja, du weißt ja, dass Dönitz war der Nachfolger von Hitler, nachdem Hitler Selbstmord Suizid begangen hat. Er war oberster Befehlshaber der Wehrmacht, nicht nur der Marine, sondern auch der Wehrmacht und hat noch in den letzten Kriegstagen viele Deserteure oder viele Fahnenflüchtige, die zum Tode verurteilt worden sind, 
musste er als oberster Kriegsherr das Todesurteil bestätigen. Das heißt, es sind noch eine Anzahl von Deserteuren wegen Dönitz seiner Bestätigung hingerichtet worden. Hitler had issued guidelines for the punishment of desertion, and these guidelines saw some mitigating circumstances. If you deserted out of youthful foolishness, there were ways that you could escape the death penalty. But for Dönitz, this wasn't true at all, and he issued a competing ordinance that called for the death penalty in every case of desertion. Obwohl der Krieg schon fast zu Ende war und in einigen Fällen war, der, war die Kapitulation schon passiert. Und selbst nach der Kapitulation hat es noch solche Hinrichtungen gegeben. Dönitz war also ein Scharfmacher, ein Durchhaltegeneral, der unbedingt wollte, dass der Krieg in, in den Gleisen, so wie Adolf Hitler das befohlen hat, zu Ende geführt wird. Oder das heißt, auch Dönitz selbst hat aus dem Krieg nichts gelernt. Und deshalb sehe ich Dönitz natürlich als Kriegsverbrecher, der er war, sehr, sehr kritisch. But back in 1946, the question of whether Dönitz was a criminal in the eyes of the law had yet to be resolved. That was the job of the International Military Tribunal at the Nuremberg Trials. During the proceedings, the prosecution confronted Dönitz with a damning piece of evidence about Nazi treatment of Allied commandos caught behind German lines. It's Dönitz who's enforcing Hitler's commando order, which stipulates that any commandos caught should be summarily shot, executed right there and then. This is a flagrant breach of the rules of war. I asked you yesterday about the secrecy standard of the original Führer order that the shooting of uniformed prisoners acting on military orders must be carried out even after they have surrendered voluntarily and asked for pardon. Most sides accept the fact that if you aren't wearing your uniform and you're spying, then basically you deserve to be executed. But commandos? No, commandos are special troops, but they're still just regular troops in uniforms fighting you know, under the rules of war. Hitler doesn't like them, Dönitz doesn't like them, and he's happy to help them get executed. Do you agree that that is a reason for giving top secret document. Yeah, I'll give you one more opportunity of answering my question. Will you answer it or won't you? Yeah, that's will ich tun. Ich halte das für möglich, zumal der Jurist hier dieser Ansicht ist. Ob das stimmt, weiß ich nicht, weil ich den Befehl nicht herausgegeben habe. Dönitz has got problems when it comes to defending himself because it's Dönitz who's behind enforcing Hitler's commando order. We hear a lot about uh, the fact that they were just following orders. That also happens to be one of the primary ways uh, in which you can use justification to try to reduce the cognitive dissonance that you may be experiencing inside. There is some evidence there that they do have some recognition that what they were doing was in fact wrong, or else they wouldn't need the justification in the first place. But the prosecution wasn't finished with Dönitz yet. They had even more shocking evidence for the court. They accused him of using slaves. 12,000 concentration camp prisoners will be employed in the shipyards as additional labor. Now that is your document. May we take it that you were familiar with the fact of the existence of concentration camps. I have never denied it. And do we have any idea how many forced laborers lost their lives building this thing? I think about 1,600 victims. My mission to determine where Nazi naval commander Karl Dönitz ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil has brought me to the German town of Reckham, near the North Sea coast, home to this massive concrete bunker called the Valentin Submarine Pants. What part of the bunker are we in here? We are now um, at the end of the whole production line. Uh, this place was meant to produce submarines on a kind of assembly line. 
Dr. Marcus Meyer is a historian and an expert in Nazi naval history. This place is absolutely ginormous. I'm still trying to get my head around how big it is. Why did they build this? They wanted to build submarines, uh, and they needed um, a kind of place that was protected uh, from Allied airstrikes. And so they decided to build this huge construction, um, which should have been bomb-proof, um, against the biggest bombs they had at that time. By early 1943, the tide of war had turned against the Nazis. Allied bombers were attacking German industrial centers day and night, threatening to shut down arms production. Hitler was looking for anything that could help him strike back. Karl Dönitz was convinced he had the answer, in the form of the powerful new Type 21 submarine. The Type 21 was an attempt to try and take out as many Allied vessels as possible. Exactly. Dönitz was responsible for this project. Um, this was the most important project of the German Navy at that time. And Dönitz was convinced that the Type 21 would win the war, basically, um, and to sink more ship space uh, than the Allies could rebuild. But to build the Type 21s, he needed a factory safe from the relentless Allied air raids. Dönitz needed a place like this. How big actually is this structure? About 419 meters long. It covers a ground, about five soccer grounds. We have walls uh, at the moment at about 4 meters 60, and uh, the roof would have been brought to 7 meters. So the walls are 4.5 meters thick? Exactly. And that should have been thick enough to protect the whole production process uh, against airstrikes. Building a structure on this scale called for a massive labor force. But the vast majority of German men were needed for the war effort. So the Nazis found another way. The key thing about the Valentin bunker is that it was constructed using massive numbers of slave laborers. They were concentration camp prisoners, mainly Soviets and Poles, along with Italian POWs and French conscripts all shipped to Reckham and forced at gunpoint to build the Valentin submarine pan. 12,000 concentration camp prisoners will be employed in the shipyards as additional labor. Now that is your document. Dönitz used slaves. I think it's a real measure of Dönitz's uh, brutality and frankly evil uh, that he's requesting 12,000 slaves. What were conditions like for the slave laborers that were forced to build this bunker? Very bad. They had nearly nothing to eat. Um, the average weight of a prisoner at that time was about 45 kilograms. Um, so say they, they, they suffered from, from having nothing to eat and nothing to drink. Um, they had to do very hard work carrying sacks of cement, about 50 kilograms, so more than their own, uh, own weight. They were forced to work very quickly. Um, they were heavily guarded. Um, there was nearly no possibility to take a break, just a short break. So it was working nearly 12 hours a day. Um, and after that, you had the life in the camps, also guarded, also um, bad conditions when it comes to what beds you get and what kind of hygiene standards you have. There were nearly no standards for hygiene. Do we have any idea how many forced laborers lost their lives building this thing? We are talking about 1,600 victims uh, during the two years. If they had managed to finish this bunker and the facilities inside it, would that have changed anything? From, I think, autumn 42 on, that was impossible. Um, the Germans could have built boat after boat after boat, but the Americans and the Canadians were faster. So the idea to sink more ship space than the Allies could rebuild um, um, was, was a fantasy. Everything about Dönitz's actions towards the end of the war shows that he was a much more fanatical Nazi than was previously suspected. He was fighting to the bitter end. 
But before that end, Karl Dönitz would receive a shocking and totally unexpected promotion. Why did Hitler choose Dönitz as his successor? I'm on a journey to find out where Nazi naval commander Karl Dönitz ranks in Hitler's hierarchy of evil. On May 1st, 1945, millions of war-weary Germans tuned in to hear an unfamiliar voice deliver some momentous news. Unser Führer Adolf Hitler ist gefallen. Der Führer hat mich zu seinem Nachfolger bestimmt. He was Hitler's hand-picked successor as head of state, not as Führer, but as Reichspräsident or President of the Reich. It's quite a surprising choice. You would have thought that someone like Himmler or Goering or some of these other uh, far more sort of kind of big Nazi political names uh, would have taken that job. I've come to the northern port city of Flensburg to find out more about Dönitz's brief tenure as president in the final days of Nazi Germany. Dr. Pust? Yeah. James, yeah. very nice Hello. to meet you. Peter Pust. Dr. Dieter Pust is a historian, author, and a leading authority on the city's history. Nice to see you in Flensburg. The city is the longtime home of the German Naval Academy. And it's where Dönitz chose to make his final stand as the only man apart from Hitler to lead the Third Reich. Why did Hitler choose Dönitz as his successor rather than Himmler, Goering, or a number of other prominent Nazi leaders? Uh, because Dönitz has been the, the truest follower of Hitler. He has been not connection to politics. So the other members of the leadership had discredited themselves in Hitler's eyes. Yes. So Dönitz was the natural successor for Hitler because he was someone who had not uh, betrayed Hitler. Yes. Dönitz has always been loyal. Dönitz has always been true. There's none of the politicking nonsense about Dönitz. He wasn't that kind of political figure, you know, always part of the center of the Nazi soap opera. When Dönitz announced Hitler's death to the German people, he stated that Hitler had died fighting at the head of his troops in Berlin. He didn't reveal the fact that Hitler had committed suicide. Why was that? Es war um den Mythos über Hitler aufrecht zu erhalten. Auch in Bezug auf die Soldaten und, und jeden Deutschen, der seine Pflicht erfüllen müsste bis zum Letzten. Und um den Mythos aufrechtzuerhalten, dass Hitler also nach seinen eigenen Grundsätzen dann sozusagen bis zum Ende für das deutsche Volk sich aufgeopfert hat. Und das war, wie gesagt, die letzte große Lüge des NS-Systems. Dönitz was unfailingly loyal. In Hitler's political testament, when he entrusts Dönitz with the position of president of the Reich, he says that Dönitz should carry out the military struggle using all means available. By this time, Berlin was in ruins, and the once mighty Wehrmacht had been reduced to a few scattered pockets of resistance. Their war was utterly lost. Nonetheless, Dönitz ordered German troops facing the Soviets to stand and fight. So where are you taking me now? Ja, wir sind auf dem Weg zu einer besonderen Station hier in Flensburg und zwar dem dem Ort, an dem Dönitz zuletzt hier in der Stadt gewesen ist. All right, let's go in. In front of us is the building where for a few fleeting weeks in May 1945, Karl Dönitz ran the final Nazi government. The Flensburg government took up offices at the Naval Academy, and it actually had some of its ministries on ships in the water surrounding the Naval Academy. This was a very strange 21 days in German history. Stranger still was Dönitz's plan to save the crumbling Reich. It's a measure of how actually detached the Nazi leadership, and in particular Dönitz was from the realities of the situation, that he calls upon uh, the Western allies to team up with the remnants of uh, the Nazi forces to actually prosecute a war against the Soviet Union. Er hat zunächst versucht, äh, Waffenstillstandsverhandlungen zu führen mit den Westmächten, mit dem Argument, in Zukunft würde der Feind aller der, der Sowjetkommunismus sein im Osten. Und äh, darauf sind aber die äh, Alliierten nicht eingegangen. So the Allies were going to keep fighting Germany until yeah. they committed to yeah. an agreement of yes. unconditional surrender. Yes. From Allied headquarters aboard the Patria at Flensburg, North Germany, 
orders go out for the arrest of the last top Nazi. Having run out of options, Dönitz announced Germany's unconditional surrender on May 7, 1945. The war in Europe was over. Now the Führer of the beaten Third Reich, Grand Admiral Dönitz himself, comes out under a light arrest. He walks through a tunnel in the Flensburg compound to imprisonment. And from here out, erfolgte dann the Überführung der, der prominenten Gefangenen zum Flugplatz Schäferhaus und von, von dort erfolgte dann die Überführung zunächst nach Niedersachsen und dann schließlich nach Nürnberg zum Nürnberger Prozess. So you're telling me that after Dönitz was arrested, he would have stood right where I'm standing yes. here. Yeah. Wow. Er hat sich dann noch beschwert, dass er nicht äh, richtig als Militär in Uniform und so weiter zur Kenntnis genommen wurde von den Alliierten, die ihn dann abgeführt haben. And it really he stood here when it had all ended for him, that he had been arrested, his time as the leader of Germany was over, and after this moment it was really just a short while before he was going to stand trial at Nuremberg. <laughs> On October 15, 1946, after nearly a year of testimony, the Nuremberg verdicts were read and Karl Dönitz learned his fate. Dönitz was indicted on three counts, conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, waging a war of aggression, and crimes against the laws of war. He was found not guilty on the first count, but convicted on the second two. Dönitz was found guilty of committing heinous war crimes, but while many of his fellow Nazis were sentenced to hang, he received just 10 years imprisonment. I think Dönitz's sentence uh, was far too short. I think he got lucky because he had a, a decent lawyer. And what's very difficult uh, when you're prosecuting a man like Dönitz is that if you start accusing him of waging unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, then you better be sure that your own side hasn't done the same thing. And Dönitz's lawyer had actually got an affidavit uh, from the US Naval Commander Nimitz to say that he too had engaged in a similar type of warfare. And this is what Dönitz can rely upon for his defense. He's gonna say, yeah, maybe I did something bad. But so did you, so why are you prosecuting just me? Standing here with Dieter on the very spot where Dönitz was taken into custody, I'm left with one last question. After the war, did Dönitz ever express regret or remorse for the crimes he committed? He said he has only so gewesen, dass er danach die Pflicht erfüllt hat und insofern äh, sich keine, keinen Grund gesehen hat. Sich da zu entschuldigen, oder? Karl Dönitz was released in 1956, the first of the major Nazis serving time to be set free. He died in 1980 at age 89. Now it's time to find out where Dönitz ranks in Hitler's Most Wanted. He is up to his neck in crimes against humanity. My journey has given me new insight into Karl Dönitz's fanatical belief in Hitler and Nazism, and revealed the truth about his use of slave labor in a pointless attempt to prolong the war. It's also demonstrated his complete lack of any remorse. Now it's time for us to decide where he should sit in the hierarchy of evil. Using our unique system of playing cards, I want to determine where Karl Dönitz ranks in Hitler's Most Wanted. At Nuremberg, Dönitz is sentenced to 10 years in prison. Do you think that's fair for his actions during the Second World War? No, I think it's pitiful. There were submarines operating with utmost ruthlessness mm -hmm. uh, against merchant shipping. Uh, many innocent men, women and children were sent to their deaths uh, by Dönitz's men on his orders. So, as far as I'm concerned, he is up to his neck in crimes against humanity. The place that I went to that had the biggest impact on me was the Valentin U-boat bunker. This was a structure that was built under Dönitz's orders by slave labor, and construction started at a time when the war was already unwinnable for Nazi Germany. What the building of that bunker shows is that you really can't separate the military and what it did from 
the human rights violations and other atrocities of the Nazi state. It's a U-boat bunker. It's built with slave labor. Dönitz has unclean hands in the crimes of the Third Reich, and you see it in the building of that bunker. One of the advantages Dönitz has as a sailor is that the Third Reich's navy, of course, is not directly involved in the Holocaust in the same way as the army and the SS and all these other apparatuses of the Nazi state. And it's that distance or perceived distance that makes Dönitz uh, look a little bit cleaner than other Nazis. Matt, given Dönitz's actions during the Battle of the Atlantic and his willing use of slave labor, what does that say about his morality? Well, the average soldier's sense of morality is going to shift to some extent uh, in times of war. There's no question about that. Uh, and yet, Dernitz's actions do seem to go far beyond what would be considered to be a normal shift in morality. His behaviors are certainly immoral. And that relatively light sentence had a detrimental effect on the process of reckoning in post-war Germany because it allowed Dernitz to retire and to write his memoirs and to peddle his narrative of who he was and what he did. Well, that seems to be evidence of a denial of responsibility. And, and that is a feature of some individuals who have committed atrocious crimes. In fact, they'll often see themselves as the victim for having been locked up. Absolutely, and I think that one of the problems that Nuremberg had was uh, is that there were uh, some Allied commanders who had committed probably very similar crimes to those committed by Dönitz, and that's why uh, the tribunal went a little bit more easily on him than it actually should have done. So what I'd like to do now is come to a conclusion as to where you think Dönitz ranks in the hierarchy of evil. Anthony, what are your thoughts? Being an admiral and being Hitler's successor as head of state aren't things to dismiss. At the same time, I don't think Dönitz was anywhere near as central to the atrocities committed by the Nazi state as some of the other people we've discussed here. So I rank him number 26. Guy, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that Dönitz, in a normal war, quote-unquote, and if he had worked for a normal regime, quote-unquote, and done the actions he had done, would be a major war criminal, I'll put him straight into the top ten. But there are so many other players in the Nazi pantheon who are a lot worse than him. So I'm, I'm going to go about 24. OK. And Matt? I'm going to largely agree with my historian colleagues here. I would rank him at 25. So it's interesting, the three of you basically have come to an almost unanimous conclusion about where he should rank in the mid-twenties. Matt, I have to agree with you. I think 25 is where he should be ranked. He's therefore the eight of spades. Karl Dönitz was a fanatical Nazi whose tactics and orders claimed thousands of innocent lives. As Hitler's successor, he tried to prolong the war. For that, he ranks 25th among Hitler's most wanted. 